not having graduated high school, which I'm not sure if you said that on, on the show, but you didn't graduate high school, but you're you're phenomenally well-educated in, in many different categories. Like, mm-hmm. if you look around the room, if you're watching the video, we're, we're essentially in a library. The whole damn house is a library. Yeah. There's there's bookcases in that room. They're all packed. Yeah. You know, well, what have you learned about educating yourself that, that people that are just, just beginning their world, their, their journey, rather, into the world of health and fitness or their... They're, they've gotten out of college and they've got their feet on the ground with a career and they want to have a family and the whole deal, but they, but they, they want to, to pursue mastery in, in whatever they want to pursue it, and they, but they, and they want to educate themselves. Like, what's the best way to do that in your mind? Yeah, that's a very good question. I actually have a course called How to Learn. It's a PPS Success Mastery Lesson 7, I believe. So if you go to mm-hmm. ppssuccess.com, that's a website where I – put 12 lessons together based on the 12 most common things I saw stopping people from living a healthy life, achieving their dreams, or being successful in their careers or their sports. And and I have a whole lesson on how to learn because I repeatedly would (laughs) have conversations with medical doctors and scientists and all sorts of people that would be at lectures of mine and go like, where in the fuck did you learn all this stuff? So the answer is this. First of all, I'll preface this by saying, Our educational system is very dysfunctional. It teaches you what to learn, but does not teach you how to learn. They tell you what books you must read, what tests you have to pass, but oftentimes that stuff in the real world doesn't help you at all, right? So once I got to the point in high school, which is when I, well, first of all, by the time I got to the 10th grade, my my girlfriend got pregnant and I became a dad when I just turned 18. So I just, and I'd become so frustrated because teachers couldn't answer my questions. They got pissed off me. Same thing happened to me in church when I'd ask questions, you know. I'd ask some very interesting questions, and I wouldn't get very well-received answers. So uh, once we went to Self-Realization Fellowship, that all healed because the monks were very open and honest. But the people in the Christian churches were very, very um, unreceptive to young minds that ask deep questions. But the point that I'm leading towards here is... We have a system that tells us what to study, but it often doesn't work. I was raised on a farm where my father would say, the baler's fixed, I'll be back in an hour. Or the the baler's broken, I'll be back in an hour. It better be fixed. Okay, what he meant was, if it's not fixed when I come back in an hour, you're going to be broken. So I learned, if you have to beg, borrow, steal, run to the neighbor's house, talk to the neighbor about why the baler won't work or why the how the fan came uh, the fan belt came off the drive pulley or whatever the hell I learned do it do it fast think on your feet be practical so I learned on a farm you doesn't you can read all the books you want and why a, 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 an animal has hoof rot but if you fart around reading books and not getting something done to fix the problem you lose all your animals so in in a, an environment where you depend on your crops and you depend on your animals you can't get into a bunch of fancy dancy theories like they do in agricultural programs in universities. You gotta keep the animals alive or you starve to death. So I learned to think practically and test things efficiently and go with what works. So how I developed my knowledge when I became the trainer of the Army boxing team, I also took over massage therapy, studied massage therapy, practiced it, and did a two-year internship with a team doctor who was an osteopathic physician. So what I did was I used the same principles of learning that I'd used in my youth and on the farm and in my exploration of athletics, studying diet, studying exercise, which is to study the people that were getting the best results and ask them how they did it. Then I don't have to read 50 books. I just went to the person that already done all that and said, oh, that's all bullshit. Just do this. But the key thing is this. I developed a tremendous amount of practical knowledge because my living was based on getting results as a therapist and as a conditioning coach or a coach. And so what I did is whenever I came into some kind of a challenge, be it an athlete that was having chronic pain or couldn't achieve a certain objective and get past a plateau or somebody that had an internal illness nobody could figure out, which might have been a parasite infection. I studied exactly what I had to study based on what the situation was. So I would study your symptoms. 
I would go to a medical library and would look up anything that talked about those symptoms. And the next thing you know, I'd find, well, there's 14 different things that can cause that. And then I would study those 14 different things and say, okay, that says this happens when you're in a dirty house where there's mold growing in the bathroom, dot, dot. So then I would say, okay, let's check your house. And lo and behold, there'd be black mold in the shower and in, on, in the sinks. And I would realize I got a serious fungal infection. They're being poisoned by mycotoxin. Now, I might have had to go through four years of university and still wouldn't have learned that. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I did what I would call situational research. What is the situation at hand and what can I take as indicators? What are the symptoms? What are the challenges we're facing? And who has the most knowledge on those topics? Which medical professional, which strength and conditioning professional, which coaching, which sport, whatever. And so I, all these books are all the research that I did into myriads of these types of situational experiences. And after a while, you start to realize, wow, all sorts of things lead back to food. All sorts of things lead back to water. All sorts of things lead back to sleep. And all sorts of things lead back to over or under exercising, as an example. So those were the common denominators. For example, I developed a system of movement called the primal pattern movement system. And what I did is I did, I studied the science of human movement and, and, and looked at it scientifically but I could not find the answers to my questions. So what I did is I studied developmental man and my wife, Penny, has a master's degree in biological anthropology. So I'd figured this out before I met her, but when I talked to her about how I figured this all out, it was very fun because she could show me uh, a more scientific academic concepts that would reinforce what I'd figured out on my own, which she was always quite impressed with. She's like, Paul, you never set foot in a university. You're talking to me about stuff that professors don't even talk about. And I said, well, yeah, I, I ask myself a lot of questions. I pretend I am that man. So what I did is I, I and here's how it happened as a segue here. Um, when I came to work for the largest physical therapy clinic in San Diego in 1986, I think it was, 86, 88, January 88, I was the first massage therapist ever to be hired by a sports and orthopedic physical therapy clinic in San Diego, and it was considered weird, and why would you ever hire a massage therapist? They're hippie nobodies, right? But the owner of the clinic had had four knee surgeries. None of her 22 physical therapists with master's degrees or whatever could figure out what was wrong. The surgeon was confused. He had to manipulate her knee twice, and he said to her, her name is Kathy Grace, he said, Kathy, if we have to manipulate your knee again, the damage could be catastrophic. You may never be able to play golf or tennis again. Well, I had rehabilitated... Uh, an elite level runner who was sponsored by Nike named Kevin McCary from bilateral Achilles problems because nobody could figure him out. And I got that guy back in the game and running within a few weeks. So he, when he found out about this, said to Kathy, he said, I know a guy you got to go see. He does all sorts of stuff I've never heard of before, but it works. So on my first visit, I got eight degrees more range of motion out of her knee than they'd gotten in three months of therapy. And she was shocked. And she said to me, Paul, I've never seen any of these techniques before. Where'd you learn them? I said, I learned them by just listening to your body. I just pay attention. I connect to the body and ask it what it wants to need. I said, you have a lot of fascial binding. You've got deep fascial adhesions. I said, the techniques I'm using on you are classically called rolfing techniques and other techniques as well. But, but the long and the short of it is she, I rehabbed her and got her back. And the surgeon said, I want to meet this guy. Whoever did this, I want to meet him. So she brought me in to meet the surgeon. Well, they offered me a job. I got to work with 22 physical therapists and trainers. But what happened was because the doctors are so uneducated about exercise, I'm rehabbing all these spinal injuries and I'm giving them squats and, and, and deadlifts and cable pushes and pulls and they're freaking out. They're like, what the hell are you doing? You can't do that to people. I said, really? Why don't you go ask Mrs. Smith how she's doing? I said, ask every one of them. Every one of them was doing better and getting better faster than they'd ever gotten. And they were completely confused. So the head physical therapist said, Paul, we really need you to explain to us how it is that you choose these exercises and how you do it without people getting hurt. Well, what I had done is I had been going through a process inside myself, which is based on what do we have to do to survive in nature? You know, it's doc doctors used to say to me, well, nobody should be squatting in the gym when they have a back injury. I said, well, I have a question for you. Have you ever seen anyone have a shit standing up? <laughs> have you ever seen anyone levitate into their car? 
because not only do you have to do a squat when you get into your car, you've got to do a single leg squat with a lateral shift and a twist coupled with a side bend. So if you're telling me this person can't do a squat with a dowel rod on their back and you've just done surgery on their spine, I got news for you. How are they going to get in out of that car without hurting themselves? How are they going to pick up their kids? How are they going to get on off the toilet? And they look at me like I'm from outer space. I'm like, these are basic damn questions that you should have been asking long before you even got your medical degree. Because it means you are not paying attention to anything once that person leaves that operating table and you're making shitloads of money and all these re-injuries, which is unethical. So the point I'm making is, what, I, what happened was Chris Siegel, the head physical therapist, who was very smart with a master's degree and, and very top-notch woman, who was very open to me, unlike a lot of them, they fought with me like cats and dogs, but they learned the hard way that they should pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> I used to tell them you guys could never run a farm. You'd all starve to death. <laughs> <laughs> all you'd be doing is ultrasounding the cows to death. <laughs> Burn their titties off. So, <laughs> you know, like I used to ask them, why are you using ultrasound on hypermobile joints? Ultrasound produces heat in tissues. Heat causes fascia to lengthen. And you're doing it on people who have seriously loose knee joints, shoulder joints. I said, you know, they're just doing what they were taught to do in school. They didn't think about it. This is what, anyhow, the point is, they said, we need you to teach us how it is you're doing all this exercise selection because we don't understand it. So I'd never had to teach a class to a bunch of physical therapists like that before to explain what I used to do as an internal process. So what I did is I got a bunch of pen boards. I had like three big full-size pen boards out. I wrote down every single exercise I could think of, and it was a lot. The pen boards were packed. And then I said, what is the common denominator amongst all these exercises with the one question in mind? What would we have to do to survive in nature? So to make a long story short, I kept connecting all the exercises and reducing them down to their essentials, and I came up with seven movement patterns that all of them were derivatives of squatting, lunging, bending, pushing, pulling, and twisting while standing on your own feet, because in nature there is no chairs or leg presses to Smith machines to balance you. So I said, what I do whenever I have a patient is I look to see which of these key movements, and now that I've shown you that these 350 or 400 or 500 or 600 exercises all come from those generalized motor programs, which is the actual term, I choose which pattern they're the weakest in and need the most improvement in, and I build them up. So if I have to have someone hold two dowel rods and do a squat, even though they now have a bigger base of support, the dowel rods still move. That's far, far more neurologically complex and rich than a Smith machine because as soon as you lean against something that's stable, your core shuts off and your balance center shut off. So you've now just cut out half the brain, and no matter how strong you are in a Smith machine, you can't do that. Your brain cannot apply force where you cannot stabilize your joints because you'll injure yourself. Mm. So I told, I showed them that, that you, there's seven key movement patterns that everything else is an emergence of, unless you have special, what I call a specialized pattern like figure skating, uh, skateboarding, uh, uh, water skiing. Then you have what I call specialized patterns where you have potential for squat, lunge, bend, push, pulling, and twisting, but you have unusual patterns that require a very specific skill set that would not have been necessary to survive in nature. So for certain athletic applications, I have to do what I call uh, specialized pattern training, which those are s skills the nervous system has to learn. To, to finish the point, though, yeah. this is just an example of how my farm boy, not academically trained mind would process information and it helped me help a lot of people that people with very fancy degrees could not help because they had not learned how to think and they had learned what to think. And when they were taught what to think, they were taught what to think by other people that also weren't grounded in reality and were doing so much research that they got detached from reality. And though it looks good on paper, like oh, look at thousands of isokinetic studies. Physical therapy used to be all isokinetic. Isokinetic means constant speed. I've never met a single person in the world that functions isokinetically, yet they would rehab them on isokinetics. I'm like, there's no way that's going to work. You're using a technology that is actually abnormal. The closest thing you can get to isokinetics is being a fish or a rower because the water creates constant resistance. 
But I, I, I would see people get 300% improvements in isokinetic strength, but they could not even get a 5% improvement in picking up a box with weight in it. So it didn't make any sense to me. So I built the whole Czech Institute system by studying situations and looking into and asking anybody that had knowledge about anything that my own research said. For example, if I had to talk to a mycologist to find out, well, what kind of mold do I need to be worried about and how do I figure out what it, I would hire a mycologist. I would pay them for their time. Or I would study mycology journals. That's how I built the entire institute and that's how I grow all my knowledge and that's what all these thousands of books surrounding you are is information by people that I respected enough to study.